Moscow, 1954. The annual May Day Parade is well underway. Ranks of soldiers and columns of vehicles roll through Red Square past cheering crowds. Overhead come waves of jet fighters. Then the skies clear. An ominous growl grows louder and louder. The crowd stills and looks to the heavens as ten giant four-engine bombers come howling past. Moments later, another eight come past. The crowd goes wild for them. The bisons had arrived, and their impact on aerial combat would shape military doctrine for the rest of the century. Countering them would cost the US billions of dollars. To understand why the appearance of the bison was so seismic requires a little understanding of the strategic context of the time. The nature of the war for the Western Allies was markedly different from that of the Soviet Union. Separated from European battlefields by the Channel and the Mediterranean, and from the Japanese home islands by the vast Pacific Ocean, strategic bombing was fundamental to the Western war plans. For that reason they developed a range of iconic high-altitude strategic bombers like the B-17 Flying Fortress and culminating in the Boeing Super Fortress. The nature of the Eastern Front caused the Soviet Union to focus its efforts on tactical bombing and close air support. The iconic bomber of the Soviet Second World War experience is therefore the IL-2. Their heavy f bomber force was a bit of a joke, consisting of a handful of relatively contemporary Petlyakov PE-8s and several hundred antique Tupolev TU-3s, which dated back to the early 1930s. These were hard work during the major battles on the Eastern Front and later served as paratrooper and other transport aircraft. The Cold War meant a shift in strategic priorities. Suddenly, the Soviet Union needed a means to strike a very well-equipped enemy many thousands of kilometres away using nuclear weapons. The Soviet aircraft industry mobilised to meet this challenge. They had many good ideas, but were somewhat hampered by a lack of experience in such aircraft. Fortunately, there was an alternative answer closer to home. Over the course of 1944 and 1945, three B-29s were forced to divert from attacks on Japan and landed in the Soviet Union. Because the USSR was not officially at war with Japan, the aircraft were interned as they had landed on the territory of a neutral country. On Stalin's personal order, these aircraft were reverse-engineered by the Tupolev Design Bureau. The resultant aircraft, the Tu-4 Bull, is probably the greatest ever reverse-engineering job in history as the B-29 was amongst the most complex machines ever constructed at the time and contained many systems and materials that were not produced in the Soviet Union. Nevertheless, they succeeded in manufacturing just under 850 of them between 1947 and 1952. In truth, this wasn't all that worrying to the planners in the Pentagon. The Tu-4 lacked the range for a strike on the US mainland, even from bases in Russia's Far East. The USSR lacked foreign allies that could push bases closer in, so any bombing missions would be strictly one-way trips. The B-29, and therefore the Tu-4, was also essentially obsolete by this point, as would be demonstrated by the heavy losses the US would take in Korea against the MiG-15. The appearance of the Bison was a rude awakening. Jet propulsion would enable it to fly much higher and faster than the present generation of US interceptors. The sheer size of the aircraft would give it the range to target the continental USA. 28 Bisons then appeared at the Tushino Air, Air Review in July 1955, another hoax as there were still only 10, leading the CIA to believe that the USSR would have over 800 of them in service by 1960. A mild form of hysteria developed in the US military industrial complex. This bomber gap was unacceptable and must be counted with massive armament and investment in new technologies as well as building more and better bombers, new generations of interceptors would be required to counter the threat. At around this time, Major John Boyd was busy collecting $40 wages as an instructor for the quirky and treacherous F-100 Super Sabre at the Fighter Weapons School at Nellis Air Force Base. Even if the 42nd legend may not be entirely true, Boyd, Boyd was an excellent pilot. One of the things he noticed as an instructor was that the basic manoeuvres of dogfighting were simply not well understood. Fighter manoeuvres were essentially passed around the ready room in idle chat rather than formally taught. John Boyd didn't think that was right. Pilots engaging in dogfights were participating in a dance of move and counter move that could be systematised. This was even more true when pilots were being ordered to attack relatively predictable targets such as intercontinental bombers. This opinion might come as a surprise to those of you who are familiar with John Boyd. He is, after all, best known for his OODA loop. 
a decision-making philosophy for pilots that teaches them to improvise based on accurate observation of their situation. You'll never hear me talking about doctrine, he often said. Doctrine too easily becomes dogma. And dogma, in Boyd's eyes, was death. Dogma is predictable and slow to change. Fast transients are the key to survival. Yet Boyd's first theoretical work, the one that made him famous and the one that arguably was the most impactful on the world during his lifetime, was all about doctrine, a 166-page treatise on fighter manoeuvres called the Aerial Attack Study. This was the first time that someone had sought to document and systematise the ways in which a pilot could attack and defend themselves in air-to-air combat. Boyd's concept was that a pilot could learn a mental algorithm of moves and counter-moves that would enable them to defeat most opponents. No Uda here, more a Taylor-style one-best-way of dogfighting, an industrial system for an industrial age. The first 60 pages of the study are useful to understand how pilots would go about intercepting badgers and bisons, and an interesting reflection on the capabilities of the weapon systems of the premier air defence fighters of the late 1950s. Boyd uses the F-100 as his reference fighter for the study, which he wrote between 1958 and 1960. Although it spent much of its career as a fighter bomber, the F-100 remained a principal interceptor on the continental USA in the 1950s, with between 15 and 20 fighter wings based there. US Air Defense Command would have also been an important part of the defense of the continental USA in the event of a conflict, but its aircraft were, were built to a fundamentally different concept, and Boyd was either unfamiliar or chose to to ignore them. The F-100 was also the backbone of US forces in Europe and Asia, and bomber interception in those theatres would have fallen to its pilots. The F-100 had two main weapons at its disposal, the 20mm cannon and the AIM-9B Sidewinder air-to-air missile. Both weapons had particular limitations which framed the ways in which a pilot would attack a jet bomber. The M39 20mm cannon is a pretty simple weapon in general. You point the nose at the, of the fighter at the target, adjust for its course and speed, and then drop the, sh- and the drop of the shells through gravity, and then you fire. The F100 had four guns, and their combined fire rate is 6,000 rounds a minute. The M39's primary limitation is its range. Although an individual cannon round remains lethal out to about 6,000 feet, and indeed the F100's disturbed sight can be set to calculate deflection out that far, In reality, bullet dispersion means that the 20mm cannon is really only able to deliver sufficient bullet density to bring down a bomber at about 3,000 feet. This immediately presents uh, a problem for an F-100 pilot on an interception mission. The the Bison carries six AM-23 23mm cannons in three turrets, one in the tail, one on top of the fuselage, and another on the bottom of the fuselage. These cannons also have a range of about 6,000 feet and are radar-directed. If the F-100 pilot wants to employ the cannon against a bison, or indeed any Soviet bomber, then he has to fly into the defensive arc of at least one of these turrets, unless he elects to engage in a head-on attack. It is worth mentioning at this point that the effectiveness of bomber defensive turrets was significantly overestimated in this period. In the confusion of attack by fighters, B-17 and B-29 bomber gunners frequently claimed hits and kills that can't be verified in the records of the German and later Russian and Chinese air forces. Irrespective, there was significant danger in flying into the range of the bison's defensive gun turrets. For this reason, the weapon of choice for attacking a bomber was the AIM-9B Sidewinder. This weapon come with some, comes with some excellent performance characteristics. It can be launched from well outside the gun turret's range. It is also a fire-and-forget weapon that detects heat from the bomber's engine and flies on a collision course towards where that bomber is heading. It has both an impact and a proximity fuse, meaning that even a near miss will shower the target with high velocity shrapnel. As with the M39, it has some important features that govern its employment though. The AIM-9B's performance envelope against a non-maneuvering target like a bomber is determined by four factors. Infrared pattern, range, the g-force that the missile can pull, and lambda, the angle off the axis of the missile over which the IR sensor can operate. Boyd's commentary on this is extensive and covers many, many pages, but I'll summarise it here. The IR sensor in the missile hones on the hottest heat source within its its arc. In Soviet aeroplanes like the Bison and the Badger, the jet tailpipes are shielded by the sweep back of the wings. Therefore, they present a long, narrow pattern in the horizontal plane. In the vertical plane, however, the pattern is long and wide because the wings don't shield the hot metal and the jet exhaust. Unfortunately, the, the detector can be easily confused. Um, if you point it at something that is either hotter than the, than the bison's engines, 
or scatters IR radiation, then it will, the sensor will get confused and aim for that something. The sun, as a very hot point source, is the worst possible backdrop to a target, but shooting towards clouds, snow, water, or just the terrain in general impacts the weapon's reliability. Shooting with open sky as the backdrop is the best option. Unlike the cannon, which effectively has no minimum range, the Sidewinder is ineffective inside 3,000 feet, about 900 metres in new money. This is because the proximity fuse has to have time to arm. It's also worth noting that the missile won't guide until about half a second after launch as it needs to clear the launch rail and the aircraft. The Sidewinder's motor burns for 18 seconds, and at that point the missile is travelling at the speed of the launching aircraft plus Mach 1.7. Maximum range depends on a variety of factors. Principally, the differences in height between the attacker and the target, and the difference in relative speed. But in summary, the, the maximum effective range of a, against a badger or a bison for a supersonic intercept of a subsonic bomber is about 14,000 feet, about 4,000 meters, 4 kilometers in change. Incidentally, uh, this uh, firing at that range would cause a further issue as the F-100's targeting radar didn't actually have that much range, so the pilot would have to estimate by eye. There's a couple of pages Boyd put, uh, puts on to, over into uh, like looking at the bomber in the, in, the, in the reticle and figuring out how big it is. If the target's also going supersonic, uh, so it's matching the speed of the interceptor, then that range drops very, very starkly, down to about 7,500 feet, still outside the range of the gun zone. So if we can move on to uh, G loading, ability to pull G is not really an issue for the Sidewinder, which even in this early B model was limited to about 10 G. But if the launching aircraft is also pulling G as it launches, then the missile is going to have to turn quite hard when it starts to guide. Remember, which is half a second off the rail. So that can mean that the missile then will exceed its 10 G limit and then potentially fail. Boyd spends three or four pages um, and, and the, so does the aim for b manual, incidentally, uh, recommending a 2G rule. The, the launching aircraft should be pulling less than 2G as it manoeuvres to track the target at the moment of launch. Lambda is also related to this 2G rule. The missile seeker is mounted on a mechanical gimbal that allows it to rotate to track the target as it manoeuvres. This mounting has mechanical stops that prevent the seeker from damaging itself. If the missile is having to turn through too great an angle, then there's a risk that the sensor will bump into its stops. The missile gyro will then stop turning and the missile will just go ballistic. So basically, after a lot of analysis, uh, Boyd's assessment is don't fire the missile outside of a 30 degree arc off the target's tail if you want it to guide. There is such a lot spoken about the effectiveness of US missiles in Vietnam. Reading Boyd's guidance on how to employ the AIM-9B Sidewinder is illustrative of how restrictive even the best air-to-air missile in its day actually was. Remember that this was supposed to be the backup weapon carried by the, uh, the Air Force's F-4 Phantom and the primary air-to-air weapon of the rest of the tactical aviation fleet. The US Navy had a slightly improved version, but not, not significantly improved. So having understood the capabilities of the F-100 as a weapon system, we can start to move on to figuring out how to attack a bomber. Although we, we always have the option, as pilots, of using the M39 cannon, as I've discussed, it brings the fighter into defensive arc of the bomber's guns unless we attack the target head-on. Unfortunately, the head-on attack reduces the window in which we have to deliver a strong enough weight of shells onto the target before the fighter either has to break off or it collides with the bomber. The latter is effective, but it is suboptimal for the pilot. Since the AIM-9B can't track a target head-on, we can also discount the nose quarter attack. That essentially leaves us four potential pursuit curves. An overhead attack, a high side attack, so a side of the target from above, diving onto it, a six o'clock attack from the six o'clock position, or an underside attack. Boyd again goes into a fair bit of detail describing the, the advantages and disadvantages of these things. In summary, overhead attack with the AIM-9B is not great for a couple of reasons. Firstly, the IR sensor is gonna to struggle to discern the target against the background. And secondly, there's a strong risk of exceeding the 2G limit because of the relative movement of the bomber versus the launching aircraft. The, the missile's having to fight against gravity to track onto the target. The high side attack does improve matters. The IR sensor discrimination will be better um, and the relative movement of the target is reduced, meaning that the 2G limit will be more easily stayed within. So high side better than the overhead. Six o'clock position attack is better still. There's no angle off limitations because you're straight behind it. The, the IR sensor will have a good sight of the target, albeit that uh, that sight will be slightly obscured by the bomber's fuselage due to the location of the engines. 
Finally, we have an underside attack, and it turns out this is the best option. IR tone is, is going to be achieved against the blue sky background, so you're going to be able to get tone from further away. Because you're firing from below, gravity is going to pull the missile down towards the target as it maneuvers, which improves the missile's advantage in maneuverability. You're also in the bomber's blind spot, so the bomber won't be necessarily able to see you coming, um, which gives you a tactical advantage. Finally, you're able to fire on the way up towards the target. You, we don't need to have climbed level or above it to press the attack, and this is really useful given that speed is of the essence if the bomber is carrying a nuclear weapon. We've now established, and we're 31 pages in now, that the best weapon for attacking the bomber is the AIM-9B Sidewinder. The best attacking position is from the underside. Success in air-to-air -air combat, though, depends on the ability of the pilot to place themselves in a position from which that firepower can be delivered. In fighter versus bomber combat, time is important also and, and, and can be really considered a measurement of success of an interception. So if we have a bomber attempting to destroy a given target, the interceptor must not only be positioned to deliver the firepower, but also expedite positioning before the bomber reaches the point of bombs away. So spatial positioning is of vital importance, whether that is guided by ground control or by the pilot in the cockpit. The interceptor is likely to be approaching the target either head-on, from the side, or from the rear. To reduce time to intercept, and thus the ability of the bomber to penetrate the defences, the nose quarter or head-on head -on approach is going to be best. Unfortunately, this also means that the AIM-9B can't be immediately employed. Boyd's solution to this is to have ground control put the interceptor on an anti-parallel course to, to the, an offset point about 15,000 feet on one side of the target's line of flight. When the attacker visually acquires the target or when GCI indicates that they're 10 miles from the target, the attacker applies full afterburner at the same time diving 5,000 feet below the target, creating vertical and horizontal offset. The interceptor then has the airspeed to execute a chandelle and then a low speed yo-yo to get into position for the perfect aim 9 shot from the 6 o'clock low position. Boyd's final advice concerns interceptor team tactics. His first observation is that Soviet bombers are unlikely to attack in neat formations. Instead, they're more likely to attack as a, sing a single plane's flights to stretch the defences out. Therefore, the traditional four-ship interceptor flight is wasteful of resources as there's no threat from fighters for the to defend against. There's the mutual supporting elements of the four-ship are, are, are completely wasted. The uh, flip side is that the single-ship flight is just too risky because there's always a risk of aircraft failures, particularly with the F-100, or, or successful defensive fire from the bomber, which uh, would prevent the interception. Therefore, in conclusion, a two-ship flight is best, and it should be arranged in a way as to allow for immediate re-attack of the target by the wingman if the lead aircraft was to fail in their AIM-9 shot for some reason. These interceptor patrol and fighting positions became the default for US Air Defense Command, as I understand it. As it happens, though, with all of this great thinking, all of this guidance, Boyd's concerns of the potential for an overload of the continental air defences were ill-founded, and as was everybody else's. The bomber gap, it turned out, didn't actually exist. CIA intelligence gathering from the middle 50s onwards showed that bison production was a fraction of what had been feared. And furthermore, the bison actually lacked the range to reach the US in a round trip, as did the, the badger. That essentially left uh, 50 to 100 TU-95 bears able to get that far by the, by the middle uh, uh, 1960s. Although early cruise missiles did extend the potential attack range somewhat, US interceptors comfortably in, outnumbered Soviet bombers. And as did US bombers. Over 1,500 transcontinental B-47 and B-52s were built in the 1950s and 60s, and the latter is still the backbone of US strategic air power today. Concern about how to successfully attack a bomber shaped US missile and avionics development over the course of the decade, leading to the AIM-4 Falcon and the AIM-7 Sparrow. Both of these missiles were developed on the assumption that there would always be perfect ground control guidance, you'd be able to identify targets from long distance, and that the bombers would fly nice, straight and level at high altitude. North Vietnam, Vietnam's MiG-17s and MiG-21s just refused to play ball with that theory. As with so many Cold War aviation tales, there is a tragic twist to the story of the F-100 as a bomber interceptor. On the 7th of April 1961, two F-100As from the 188th Fighter Squadron of the New Mexico Air National Guard took off to practice intercepts on a passing B-52B named Suidad Juarez 
Its commander wasn't best pleased about being a target, but the B-52 was on autopilot and it gave his tail gunner a chance to practice laying his twin 20mm cannons on realistic targets. The fighters made five passes at the B-52, coming in from 6 o'clock in order to let their sidewinders lock onto the bomber's eight engines. These were live missiles, but only the seekers were active. The motors were disengaged by safeties on the panel. The F-100s were beginning to run low on fuel, but elected to make a final pass. As they did so, the lead pilot, diving onto the tail, the bomber's tail, he, he heard the sidewinder tone as he achieved a lock-on, but then was horrified by the thump and roar as one of his missiles shot from the rail and screamed towards the B-52. He yells onto the radio, look out, one of my missiles is loose, but as he gives the warning, the AIM-9B hit the left side inboard engine nacelle, blowing the left wing of the bomber completely off. The B-52 spiralled down, three of the seven crew were killed and the others suffered severe injuries as they ejected or were thrown clear of the wreckage. It turns out that moisture had condensed in a worn connector plug, causing a short that allowed the sidewinder to launch. Such a tiny thing to cost three lives. I hope you've enjoyed the video. It was certainly an interesting one to make. Um, we, we know so much more about uh, fighter tactics, air combat manoeuvres uh, than today than were known about in the 1950s and 60s when these things were starting to be formalised. So I think it's quite interesting before we talk about the historic, historical air-to-air -air combat to really get a sense of what was known and unknown, what the doctrines were, what the common wisdom was on these things, uh, so we can make more accurate judgement about the decisions, tactical and strategic, that were made at the time. Um, it's also the case that some of these, uh, some of the historical context informs the weapon systems themselves and the way they were built. Again, easy to criticise from a long distance about why things were the way they were, particularly when we talk about um, the, the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese uh, Air Force versus the US Air Force and how, how that all played out. So anyway, if you've enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing to it. If you've got comments or thoughts on, on, uh, on the topic, I'd love to hear them in the comments. You guys uh, always leave amazing comments and I find them very interesting to read and certainly very inspirational for new content. Thanks a lot. See you again soon.